New developments in the case of Melissa Lucio, where her case is going next after supporters' campaigns have paid off. Plus, Texas A&M students will have plenty to look forward to for a new scholarship program to a new athletics facility. And we have seen quite a bit of rain across the Brazos Valley today. In fact, we set a record for precipitation here on the date of April 25th. And we'll show you that and any more rain to come. Your 25 News starts right now. Connecting the Brazos Valley, this is KRHD News. A stay of execution for a South Texas mother on death row. Melissa Lucio has been granted a stay of execution as of this afternoon. Lucio is accused of murdering her two-year-old daughter in 2007. However, new evidence casts doubt on the original verdict. Lucio's supporters insist that issues with the investigation, as well as ambiguity with Lucio's confession, are reason to withdraw the execution. Her case has been sent back to Cameron County, where she was originally tried, to weigh whether or not she is innocent, as well as examine if the state represented false testimony and hid evidence from the defense. No date is currently set for the retrial. Another Texas death row inmate, Rodney Reed, will have his case heard by the Supreme Court. Reed was sentenced more than 20 years ago for killing a Bastrop County woman in 1996. Reed's defense is challenging a state statute on post-conviction DNA evidence testing. They say evidence at the scene could exonerate him. Lower courts say his request is barred because the defense waited too long to file the claim. A New York judge is holding former President Donald Trump in civil contempt. It comes after the state's attorney general's office said Trump did not comply with the subpoena for documents as part of its investigation into the Trump organization. The New York Attorney General Office has been investigating the organization for more than two years for fraud in appraisals and financial statements. Trump faces a fine of $10,000 a day until he complies. He has called the investigation against him a witch hunt. Closer to home, Democratic candidate for Texas Governor Beto O'Rourke has tested positive for COVID. According to his campaign, he tested positively this morning after a regular test during the campaign and is experiencing mild symptoms. He says he is fully vaccinated and has his booster and adds that he will be following public health guidelines. The body of a missing Texas National Guard soldier has been found after he went missing while trying to rescue migrants in the Rio Grande River, according to multiple reports. 22-year-old specialist Bishop Evans assigned to Operation Lone Star along the Rio Grande when he spotted two migrants drowning. While trying to cross the river, Evans jumped in to rescue them. The two men he was trying to save both survived and are being held by Border Patrol. Should public schools be allowed to pray more? For decades, schools have generally been restricted with when they can offer prayer over concerns it would alienate non-religious students. But a case going before the Supreme Court today could drastically change that. Our Joe St. George has a closer look at what is at stake and what could change at your child's school. Let's talk about prayer, shall we? Oh boy, I know what you're thinking. What's the local news doing talking about faith? It's personal. No, I'm not a TV preacher. I'm a TV reporter. Growing up in my house, church was a once a week kind of thing. Maybe religion isn't your cup of tea. Regardless of whether or not you think prayer is a private matter or not, though, it's going to be a very public debate this week. You see, the Supreme Court is taking up Monday the case of Joseph Kennedy. He's a former assistant high school football coach in Washington State who prayed for years privately, which is his right, on the 50-yard line after football games. What started out as a private act, though, some allege, became a more public event with court photos showing how players and parents, in many cases, would join him. The coach was fired from the school back in 2015 after school officials believed he violated long-established principles, dating all the way back to the 60s, 
prohibiting school officials from praying publicly while they were performing their official school duties. The coach, as well as many religious organizations, disagree, and since then, they've been fighting to get to the Supreme Court to allow for post-game prayer. The reason why this case is so interesting is because the high court is more conservative today than it has been for decades, and they're taking up more cases surrounding religion, and there's a chance they could allow more school officials, like coaches and teachers, to pray more publicly. Those individuals have always had the right to pray privately. Many civil liberty groups want schools to remain neutral when it comes to religion. After all, what if a student doesn't share the same beliefs as their teacher or coach? A recent study found 71% of the U.S. identifies with a form of Christianity, like Catholicism or being a Protestant, but 6% of the country identifies as non-Christian, including Hindus and Jewish Americans. 23% of the country, though, identifies as being non-religious. Expect a ruling from the Supreme Court sometime by midsummer, and it's possible that justice is ruling a way that makes prayer a lot more prevalent in public schools by the beginning of next school year. I'm Joe St. George reporting. Top U.S. leaders are reassuring Ukraine today that the U.S. is fully committed to helping them push Russia out. The Secretary of State and Defense Secretary met with Ukraine's president in Ukraine. They said the U.S. has approved another $300 million in foreign military aid and a $165 million sale of ammunition. Now, up to 100,000 Ukrainian refugees will soon be welcomed to the U.S. The process starts today for any American interested in sponsoring one of those refugees. It's an incredibly streamlined process for providing a pathway to safety. We're excited about its potential to demonstrate possibility for tapping into Americans' willingness to play this type of welcoming role and therefore to be able to expand programming of this type and opportunities for this kind of access to safety to additional people fleeing Ukraine, but also other populations in need. So if you're hearing this and you're interested, here's how it works. A sponsor will help Ukrainian refugee find safe housing and make sure their other basic needs are met. It may be a Ukrainian American who has a relative that they wanna to bring to the United States, but any American can become a sponsor. Organizations looking for potential sponsors can connect you so you can start the application process. It includes security and background checks on both the sponsor and the refugee. There are plenty of other ways to help if you can't make this type of commitment, and that includes donating extra airline miles that you may have, opening up a room in your home temporarily through airbnb.org, or donating to help cover housing costs. But just making a refugee feel welcome in your community could have a huge impact too. Having a friend and a guide who's just, you know, taking you through the grocery store, telling you the best places, you know, the best parks in your neighborhood for your kids to play in, or you know, sharing a meal with you once a week and making you feel included and part of the community and welcomed is so important. She's the CEO of the nonprofit Welcome.us. They're coordinating the effort to help Ukrainian refugees coming to the United States. And they also coordinated help for the nearly 100,000 Afghan refugees who arrived in the fall. And she says those refugees still need our help too. They arrived in the middle of a major housing crisis. So in many high impact cities, um, they're still in temporary housing and they're still in hotels and other temporary accommodations. And you really can't rebuild your life until you're in your home and your kids can register at the local school and you can find a job that's close to where you live. Now, she says close to 20,000 Afghans in the United States still have significant housing needs. You can find ways to help both Afghan and Ukrainian refugees and information about sponsorship on the website, welcome.us. Well, not turning your camera on for a video meeting if you're working from home may not be a good look to your boss. That is at least what a new survey is saying. We're talking to a career expert who says this shouldn't make you feel pressured to return to the office. This Texas A&M Corps of Cadets has created a scholarship for out-of-state students. KRHD News reporter Diamond Dixon spoke with a senior in the program to learn how it's benefiting students. The Corps of Cadets will offer a new scholarship to current and incoming Corps students that will be equal to in-state tuition. It helped my parents out, helped me out, and that's one of the biggest things because they helped me a lot through all this and there's just one little bit way that I could help them is just to maintain that and take a little bit more of the pressure off of me. Um, and to help 
really pressure off of them, which is always the biggest blessing and has just helped in terms of coming out of school with a little less, a little less money owed. And um, yeah, it just, it's just a great benefit. Grace Pick says it's helped her parents tremendously. I think it's going to be a big benefit. Um, like I said, coming from out of state, having in-state tuition is a huge blessing um, because it just relieves a lot of financial burden that a lot, of, a lot of the population here is from Texas, so they don't have that extra added weight. But I also know a ton of people who would love to come to A&M who might not want to because they aren't able to pay that. Grace had the opportunity to receive a non-resident tuition waiver. Now, other students in the Corps will have a scholarship specifically for them. Even with the Corps, I'm like, you get a whole new family down here. Like, it seems scary to move across the country and to not know where you're going, not know anybody, but you're going to have a whole new family here that's going to love you and support you. Grace believes this scholarship will help give others the chance to attend A&M. Reporting in College Station, Diamond Dixon, Carey, HG News. An online publication is listing College Station as a top-tier university town in Texas. At number one was College Station, home of the Aggies and the flagship A&M campus. The list was reportedly based on the cost of living, nightlife, and the ratio of undergrad population and safety. Although on the other side of the coin, neighboring towns are said to have seen housing prices jump up hand-in-hand -hand with new developments. In honor of the 100th anniversary of the 12th Man Tradition, Texas A&M Athletics and the 12th Man Foundation has announced plans for the centennial campaign. The campaign features redevelopment of the Bright Football Complex and the construction of a few new facilities, a new academic and wellness center, football indoor performance center, and an indoor track stadium. The, the 12th Man Foundation plans to secure $120 million in funding, the largest fundraising effort by the foundation since redeveloping Kyle Field. The Brazos Valley Economic Development Corporation released its economic indicators for the month of April. The business cycle index increased by 0.3 percent for January to February 2022, continuing its rebounding from the impacts of the pandemic. The unemployment rate held at 3.7 percent and the local leisure and hospitality sectors saw significant improvement. The local economy is continuing to look very strong. The overall index improved by another 0.3%, which is a small incremental increase, but that's the kind that you want is good steady growth. The Economic Development Corporation is also seeing a talent shortage in the Brazos Valley with many job openings available in various job sectors. As gas prices stay high, relief may come from a surprising place. One biofuel scientist has discovered a way to use the byproducts of whiskey to fuel your car. According to Zero Waste Scotland, for every liter of whiskey, there is a huge amount of waste. The scientists use a fermentation process to transform this byproduct into biochemicals to replace some oil-based products, including diesel used in our cars. In Scotland, some cars are already being fueled by the product. Twitter announced Monday afternoon it is selling the company to Elon Musk for about $44 billion. The news comes just after a week after the billionaire shocked the industry by offering to buy the social media giant less than a week ago. Musk revealed he had taken a more than 9% stake in the company. The deal will put the world's richest man in charge of one of the most one of the world's most influential social media platforms. In a tweet Monday, Musk says he hopes his biggest critics stay on the platform to help bolster free speech. A pretty good weekend at the box office for some bad guys. The animated movie The Bad Guys beginning in 20, bringing in $24 million in its first weekend. It's enough to knock the third Fantastic Beasts movie from first to third place. In its second week, Sonic the Hedgehog 2 is holding on to second place, while the Viking epic The Northman and the Nicolas Cage meta-comedy The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent debuted in fourth and fifth place. Taking a look at our Clark Roofing Cam Sky in Motion, we've seen scattered showers and a few thunderstorms across the area today. Nothing that's been severe, but we've had rain from time to time. Some of that coming down pretty heavy. 
especially during the morning hours. And we did see a record amount of rain and we'll update again at 10 o'clock, but over two inches, which breaks the daily rainfall record for Bryan College Station. That was just over two inches, so a very wet day here in the Brazos Valley and the rain continues off and on and that will go all the way into the mid evening hours before drier air will start to work in from West Texas and work its way into our area. But until then, a few scattered showers will be possible from now going right on into seven o'clock Tuesday morning. So I'd have a 30 to 40% chance of some of those showers continuing across the area, but it clears out Tuesday afternoon, partly cloudy skies, sunshine returns and it should feel really good on Tuesday and likely Wednesday as well. With high temperatures into the 70s both afternoons. We are looking at a couple of nice days on the way after a rainy Monday here across the area. So tonight temperatures will be falling down into the 50s for the most part, a little below normal. 59 for Bryan College Station, 55 Rockdale and Cameron and 57 in Madisonville. Then tomorrow highs will make it up into the 70s again with some of that afternoon sunshine. We should be feeling pretty good here across the area and looking at your forecast those temperatures hanging out into the mid 70s on Tuesday again a few morning showers possible clearing out into the afternoon 55 Wednesday morning 79 that afternoon 80s return on Thursday into Friday maybe a slight chance for a couple of thunderstorms on Friday and then it goes up just a little bit more not a washout of a weekend but we could have a couple of thunderstorms around especially during the evening hours as we move into Saturday and Sunday that's something we'll be tracking for you closely and high temperatures will be into the 80s, then there could be another chance for a few showers and storms by the middle part of next week. The Department of Veterans Affairs is expanding the number of conditions it recognizes that are connected to toxic burn pits. Those are piles of trash the U.S. burned around the clock in Iraq and Afghanistan using jet fuel. Nine rare respiratory cancers have been added to the list. Just take a look at your screen to see them right here. Veterans with the cancers are now eligible for certain disability and health benefits. President Biden says he is still pushing Congress to pass legislation that would cover all veterans exposed to these burn pits. But some lawmakers have concerns over that legislation. One congressman from Illinois fears that the VA wouldn't be able to handle the influx of patients that it would create. There's also a pretty big cost associated with it. A proposed measure known as the PACT Act would cost $300 billion over a decade, but without any action, an estimated 3 million veterans continue to suffer. The stench was horrific. It smelled like burning rubber. It burned 24-7. Now, Even with the renewed push from the president, it is unclear if we'll see any action this year. This About 8% of the world's forests are here in the United States covering 800 million acres. To put that into perspective for you, that is larger than the states of Alaska. Texas and California combined. Our forests are increasingly being impacted by severe weather, but Maya Rodriguez shows us researchers have a new way of finding how to best help forests recover. She takes us to the place that has become a living outdoor lab by a stroke of fate. In the aftermath of destruction, disbelief, uh, shock, reality can set in. We lost uh, so much. Sometimes, though. All right, team two, come join me here. There's a chance to gain much more. Because you might be finding a pile of logs over there. It may be hard to tell, but this was once this, an old growth forest and the pride and joy of the Temple University Ambler Field Station. This patch right here um, has been a focus of our research and our education. How big was it? But last September, the remnants of Hurricane Ida swept across the Northeast, causing devastating flooding and spawning multiple tornadoes in areas that don't normally get any. One of them cut a seven mile path right through the forest. Somebody asked, you know, how are you going to be an arboretum without any trees? It was a good question. Oh, we that, did like the second. Yeah, we ID'd one of those. One that eventually led to an unusual pivot. We had designated it as an ecological observatory prior to that. Um, and our feeling was, well, this doesn't change that. You can go to the branch and, and identify it. So the destroyed forest became part of a new class and a new research endeavor called disturbance ecology. Field Station Director 
Amy Freestone. Whether it be uh, wildfires or um, uh, invasions by insects um, or tornadoes or hurricanes or flooding, um, these are disturbances. Um, and so fundamentally, they alter an ecosystem. This is eight meters here. Students and researchers here are focusing on how a forest recovers from destructive events. While this area um, is, is untouched um, after the, the storm, um, an adjacent area was cleared. If left um, untouched, all of the, the plots will ultimately revert to forest. Um, and so we're going to watch um, how that trajectory plays out. That's important because it can help land managers and communities figure out the best course of action to restore forests, which play an important role. Forests are immensely important um, for society. We get a lot from natural systems and forests in particular, you know, so we get food, water, energy, medicine. Donning hard hats. Um, trees here were over 130 uh, feet tall. They That's were pretty tall. They're very tall, yeah. We carefully make our way through what's left for a closer look. You can see the huge mounds that they create when their root structures have been pushed up. I definitely was surprised by the whole effects of the aftermath of the tornado. Students like Timothy Briner are also seeing another side to the recovery here from nearby homeowners still recovering from the storm's destruction. A lot of people were able to share their own personal stories who lived around here, and that was really interesting to see kind of how it affected them. The next day, people who had no roofs or lost their cars or lost their offices or all of the above were calling to find out what they could do to replant their trees. We've become more ingrained in the, in the community. We've become a part of it, and we have all these lessons that we can teach. That's really cool. Lessons they hope can be applied to forests everywhere. It could be that big tree. Facing the long road to recovery. In Ambler, Pennsylvania, I'm Maya Rodriguez. All right, Maya, thank you. You're probably going to want to stick around for this next story because the division of household chores has more of an impact than you may think on couples' relationships. When you enter in a relationship, it's not sexy to talk about who's gonna do the dishes, right? Yeah, we're breaking it down. What new research is suggesting leaves both men and women happiest when it comes to dividing up chores. This Keeping your camera on during a meeting for work that's virtual may not always feel like the best option, whether it's simply you're not in work attire, or maybe you have a roommate in the background, maybe your family members are right there, but survey data from software firm Viopta finds that 92% of managers think employees that do this don't have a long-term future at the company. It seems a bit harsh. Now, 94% say that in-person employees have more of a chance for promotion than those who are working remote. I think it's an extension of this fear that if we can't see you, you're clearly not working. We're struggling with understanding that we need to be measuring productivity versus FaceTime. It doesn't make you a better employee because I can see your face. Now, jobs expert Julie Balke feels that this data is more telling of the perceptions that managers need to work on. She predicts it will improve in the next five to 10 years as younger generations step into more leadership roles and change the norm. But in the meantime, she says, if you are working remotely or have a hybrid schedule, data like this shouldn't make you feel pressured into returning to the office. Instead, work more on open communication with your manager and your coworkers. And maybe it's a bi-weekly summary of everything that you've done. Maybe you meet your team for lunch once every two weeks. Maybe you, you know, find out when everybody's birthdays are, make sure you call them. So you, it's up to you, if this is important to you, to create and build and maintain those relationships and those communication channels. Now she says it can also help to have upfront conversations about why you may, may need to keep your camera off for a Zoom meeting. As we deal with the increasing threat to cybersecurity, the people being recruited to protect us may not be who you'd expect. A security incident, especially one, let's say, five, ten years from now, it's not going to be in a textbook. So you need people who can think outside the box. Tomorrow, why there's a new focus on who could take cybersecurity jobs, including those who have been in prison to fill the tens of thousands of open positions in the United States. But still to come today, the increasing effects of climate change aren't just a concern for our environment, why there is a growing concern for our national security as well and the work that's happening to address this. This. 
Not all heroes wear capes, and in this case, he's a four-legged friend. A stray dog in Cameron has been rescued and is now providing support to members of Legacy Nursing. CareHD News reporter Rebecca Fiedler shares the Great Dane story. For the residents of this small town nursing home, there's been one bright spot in the pandemic, Marmaduke the Great Dane. The pup was first rescued as a stray in late 2019, and by 2020, the animal nonprofit Milam Touch of Love knew just the forever home where he would fit in. Definitely during COVID when everything was locked down, I mean, he helped the nurses, the staff members, kind of reassured the families that couldn't come in and visit that, you know, there's just an extra presence there that was taking care of them. His dog beds cover the property and he can let himself indoors and out. While he's not allowed in the cafeteria, he makes his way to the rooms of residents like Grace T. Lander for leftovers from dinner. Oh yeah, he is a good dog. Staff say that Marmaduke's presence makes the facility feel a little more like a real home. And the comfort he brings both residents and caregivers is unique. Reporting in Cameron, Rebecca Fiedler, KRHD News. The fight to slow the impacts of climate change is starting to take on new importance. Some security leaders are now sounding the alarm that our national security could be compromised by a warming planet. Chris Conti explains why. If you're like me, the first thing that probably comes to mind when you're thinking about climate change is maybe rising sea levels or perhaps more intense storms. But I was surprised to learn recently that everything that's going on with our climate is having a major impact on national security. Quite ignorantly, I made an assumption about this story that only in the last decade or so did we start studying the national security impacts of climate change. In one way, it's a large social challenge because People don't always react to challenges that still seem somewhere off in the future. But Ron Dole, an associate professor at Florida State University, was quick to give me a history lesson and some perspective. The greater the instability of the climate, the greater the instability in the larger political landscape, national landscapes. Right after World War II, scientists at the Department of Defense began collecting data from the North and South Poles and saw they were getting warmer. Why did the U.S. military suddenly care? Because the warming of the North Sea meant the Soviets would more easily be able to move their navy around the world. So understanding what was going on, including whether the climate was warming, was really important. I wanted to better understand the current day impacts of climate change on national security, though, which is where John Conger comes in. Now, climate change is a today problem. It is something that is happening today, the impacts we're dealing with today, and they're only going to get worse. He says more intense storms will not only impact the power grid our military installations rely on, there'll also be more tangible impacts on our armed forces. As climate change proceeds, you have installations that were built with a certain expectation for climate conditions and weather, um, and that's changing. Sea level rise is going to yield more recurring flooding. You can't fly off a flooded runway. Then there are the broader impacts globally. Geopolitical conflicts, war and migration will all be amplified by a warming planet. It's also going to drive instability around the world. And so in that context, uh, they, they often call climate change a threat multiplier. It makes bad situations worse. The Department of Defense is continuing to look at ways to make our security systems more resilient to climate change. If you ignore it, but your adversaries do not, you leave yourself a blind spot. When it comes to the broad reaching impacts of a warming planet, though, it appears all assumptions should be off the table. I'm Chris Conti. All right, Chris, thank you. Now, loved ones of shooting victims often never recover from the trauma. But there's a new type of training that is offering hope to find peace. Immediately, we both found that we were sleeping better. And within the time period of the, the class, I had gone off of my sleeping medication. The other possible benefits that researchers see from focusing on mindfulness. This. 
Well, we've seen quite a bit of rain here across the area. In fact, it was record breaking rain in Bryan College Station, as we've seen well over two inches. Some folks in eastern Brazos County seeing up to four inches of rain, so it has been a very wet day across the area, but that continues to slide off toward the east and away from us. And as we check out the scattered shower potential for tonight, it'll be there, but I think things will start to wind down as we head towards sunrise Tuesday morning and we clear out Tuesday afternoon. So a few showers in the morning, clearing out in the afternoon. Temperatures looking nice as well, probably hanging out in the 70s and we'll do it again Wednesday. A few clouds in the morning, partly cloudy skies in the afternoon and we are looking good here across the Brazos Valley and looking at your forecast. Temperatures will be down to the 50s tonight. We'll go about 59 Bryan College Station, 57 Caldwell and 55 in Franklin. Then tomorrow highs into the 70s. A gorgeous day after a rainy Monday and a little bit of that sunshine to go along with it. And looking at your forecast, temperatures will be in the mid 70s Tuesday, a couple showers in the morning, 79 on Wednesday, 83 Thursday, and then maybe a slight chance of a shower and thunderstorm potential there on Friday. I think it goes up a bit more as we head into the weekend. There will be a weak boundary in the area that could provide a focus for a couple of showers and thunderstorms. Models go back and forth though how much they want to kick out. So I'm not totally on board just yet. So we'll go about 30 to 40 percent and continue to track that. Highs will be into the 80s with lows into the upper 60s. So it will be muggy across the region to give us that chance for a few of those showers and storms. The pandemic changed how we work both outside and inside the home. And that could be bad news for some couples. Ultimately, you know, it's a factor in, in their relationship stability, right? Whether they break up or they stay together. So Dan Carlson is with the Department of Family and Consumer Studies at the University of Utah. He just put out new research on why how you divide household chores matters and what makes couples feel the most satisfied. For women who share housework equally with their partner, you know, they have a 50-50 split. If they're not sharing any tasks with their partner, their levels of satisfaction with their relationship are as low as women who do all of the housework. And if you look at men, right, um, men who share the majority of tasks with their partner are as happy as men who do no housework. Interesting research. Carlson says essentially men and women need to share the same tasks, things like cooking, cleaning, laundry, and shopping to feel most satisfied. He says that is in part because the division of labor feels more equal and it affects you both in the same way. Now, rather than one person always being stuck with less rewarding chores, but he says oftentimes couples don't discuss this and just fall into a pattern. Splitting tasks requires more coordination and communication, which is a good thing. When you're doing tasks and they're your sole responsibility, even if you like it, you can feel resentment over always having to do it. You know, it's just, I'm always doing this, my part, I, you know, and, and you just might feel like I, that you've been doing it a lot um, and your partner doesn't chip in. The research presented today by the Council on Contemporary Families included surveys over several decades. Now they're looking closer at what happened during COVID. Carlson says that essential household responsibilities went up and at first men and women shared equally, but now more men than women have gone back to work and women are still doing more chores. Now, demand for new home construction is still drastically outpacing supply. The modular home industry thinks it has the answer. 400% more construction can be built out of, a, out of a facility like this than on site. Now, some places are trying to encourage more of this type of home building. This. More Americans died of gun-related injuries in 2020 than in any other year on record, according to stats from the CDC. In many major cities, this year's on pace to break that record. Loved ones of shooting victims often never recover from the trauma. But Alexa Liako shows us how researchers are finding these traumas can be alleviated. Okay, come sit. Peace is something Sandy and Lonnie Phillips find when they can. Hey girl. In moments like this, they can catch a glimpse. It's the simple stuff. But peace is impossible to hold on to for long because they're missing a piece of their hearts. Well, Jesse was always a bundle of energy. Uh, I often describe her as a Labrador puppy. Uh, she just loved everyone and everyone loved her. Lonnie was Jesse's stepdad. He loved her from the day they met. She and I become buds right off the bat. 
Their little girl grew up with dreams of being a sports reporter. We were very, very proud of the woman that she had become. When she was 23, she left San Antonio for Colorado, where school and internships were waiting. But the life she was building was cut short. Just days before Sandy planned to visit her daughter, Jesse and her friend went to the movies for a midnight showing of Batman. I said, OK, well, I'll talk with you tomorrow. And she said, Mom, go back to sleep, get some rest. I can't wait to see you next week. I need my mama. And I replied, I need my baby girl. And that was the last thing we ever said to one another. Sandy got a call in the middle of the night from Jesse's best friend. Her daughter was killed in the 2012 Aurora Theater mass shooting. Well, then we were laying there with her out of her mind and me thinking to myself, I no longer have a daughter and my wife is never going to be the same. And our life was never going to be the same. Yeah. The loss sent Sandy and Lonnie into a depression they can barely remember. We mapped this out so you could show you how dramatic the effect was across the board, really. But it wasn't until they found a research wow. study run by Fadel Zidane at the University of California at San Diego that they felt their own souls begin to rest. There's really a sense of helplessness that arises when we see victimhood from the just um, ubiquitous, just never ending uh, senseless gun violence that arises in this country. But what do we do? Sandy and Lonnie, along with dozens of other gun violence survivors across the country, spent eight weeks practicing mindfulness. They did hours long guided meditations and other practices to help them be more present. The more that we meditate, the stronger that our ability to regulate our emotions and stay in the present moment. Well, immediately we both found that we were sleeping better. And within the time period of the, the class, I had gone off of my sleeping medication. Uh, my blood pressure had gone down. With mindfulness training, the survivors found PTSD and depression decreased by 52%. Self-reported trauma decreased by 37% and overall grief decreased by 23%. They were able to finally be able to close their eyes and not see the trauma of their child. And these findings are just the beginning. Mindfulness can help people that are suffering from the worst type of human trauma, that maybe mindfulness can be more beneficial for other forms of trauma and grief. My son's wedding uh, almost two years ago now. The Phillips just hope other survivors see the peace they found and know. While grief will never vanish, there is hope. Those we love can never be more than a thought away. For as long as there is a memory, they live in our hearts to stay. True. I'm Alexa Liaco. This Tennessee is poised to be the first state to put a new punishment in place for the most severe drunk driving cases. In crashes involving death, a bill would require the offenders pay child support to their victims' children. In at least a handful of other states, they're also considering similar legislation. You have to create something to be a constant reminder to them as well as to, I can never do this again. I destroyed this family because sadly, most of them become repeat offenders. The bill was created by a grandmother now caring for a child who lost his parents and baby brother in a drunk driving crash. A major food producer is chipping in for its 120,000 employees in the U.S. to go to school. Tyson Foods is launching a free college education program, the company putting $60 million into this four-year plan. The pandemic was changed, uh, changed really what we do at home and what we want to do at home. The America at Home study looks at what people are interested in when it comes to buying a home. And one of the big ones they found, open floor plans. Those seem to be here to stay as more time is spent working and living at home. And with continued supply chain delays and labor shortages, demand for new home construction over the past two years has drastically outpaced supply. But Usher Qureshi found one part of the industry that is seeing big business is modular home construction. We are in the future of construction building, whether it's residential or commercial real estate. Inside this 60,000 square foot factory, the Sheeler family is building homes one room at a time. The pieces consist of a floor assembly, walls, and a ceiling system. The prefabricated houses are built in sections or modules. We start building the floor and then we crane that up and fly it over with our cranes 
uh, and put it online. They then moved from station to station, a sort of home building assembly line. Electrical, plumbing, um, drywall, painting, flooring, cabinets, trim, everything's pretty much complete when it's finished, about 95%. Eventually, the modules are shipped to the lot and put together like Legos directly on the foundation. I would imagine you have to make sure that they're very rigid and sturdy yep. when you do that. Yeah, so this is, this is a, a foam glue, and it's, it's, uh, we spray it on, and then it hardens, and this stuff is hard. And the, what this does for us is, uh, because we have to move modular, pick them up, this adds so much more strength all the way down the stud. Constructed to code and fully inspected, inside they're indistinguishable from traditionally built homes. A very open concept design. One of the biggest cost savings comes from the speed at which these factory built homes can be completed. Between 30 and 50 percent faster than homes built on site. We're not affected by the weather. There's no weather delays when we're building indoors. So uh, that is the advantage. We can build all year round and, uh, and not be affected by any of that. Homeway Homes shifted from building traditional on-site homes to exclusively focusing on modular construction about 17 years ago. At any given time, they're building about six to seven homes inside this construction facility, and they're completing about one and a half homes per week. When they used to construct on site, they could only build about 12 homes a year. 400% more construction can be built out of, a, out of a facility like this than on site. The global modular building market grew from $72 billion in 2020 to nearly $76 billion last year. It's forecast to grow to almost $115 billion by 2028. States are taking notice. In Colorado, a new bill calls for $40 million in grant funding to be dedicated to innovative housing like modular homes. Time is money and uh, yeah, you can definitely save some money on modular construction. On Chicago's west side, modular duplexes built in off-site factories are helping to create affordable housing by reducing construction costs and shortening completion times to just 90 days. That's the beauty of modular, to make it easy and quicker for the homeowner, for the real estate investor, uh, to get their job done quick with quality. And amidst a growing national housing shortage, modular building might just provide the right fit. Reporting from Central Illinois, I'm Usher Qureshi. Thanks for watching CARE HD News at 6. I'm back tonight at 10. Until then, have a good day.